Friedman, the medical director at Phoenix Spine and Joint. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Tim Burt. Hello, Dr. Burt. Hello, how are you? Good. Thanks so much for being with us. We are, I'm really excited today because Dr. Burt's going to talk to us about a problem which really plagues a lot of people in our community and for which, quite frankly, it can be hard, if not impossible, to find good medical care. Uh, and that is a torn labrum in the hip. Let me start by bragging about him. Dr. Burt is an expert. He is a board certified orthopedic surgeon whose practice includes the arthroscopic repair of torn labrum in the hip. He's one of the few people in Phoenix I would go to if mine were torn. And so I'm really excited for y'all to hear today what he has to say. So welcome, welcome. Thank you. Well, you know, the first thing everybody asks when they find out you go, you have some pain in your back, it goes into your groin, you see your doctor, they try some physical therapy, it doesn't work, you get an x-ray, it doesn't show anything, you get an MRI, you get home and you get the report, torn labrum. What What is that? What What is the labrum? How do you tear it? And, and what does that mean? Yeah, so a torn labrum in your hip is um, basically the gasket seal of your hip socket. So it's a piece of cartilage that lines the rim of your socket and you can tear it uh, being active, doing sort of any sort of rotational type of activities. Um, I see a lot of patients who are weekend warriors kind of get back into CrossFit or some sort of workout program. And they do a lot of squats or lunges and then they can end up tearing their labrum because they're pinching the labrum or rotating their hip in a certain direction they're not normally used to. And so just like the meniscus in the knee, over time that labrum isn't as strong as it was when you were 21 years old. So, you know, when you get in your 30s and 40s and you're still staying active, there's always a risk that you can damage the labrum in your hip. Yeah, it's amazing how uh, aging is not for the faint of heart. Here's a picture of the lay of the hip, kind of an illustration. And it, this is the labrum here, this white area. Correct. It looks pretty strong. I mean, can you tear that stepping off a curb or is it, you mentioned sports injuries, but are there some people who really don't have a specific injury or is it almost always a snap and, and there you go? It, you know, it's a combination. I see patients who have, you know, falls or twists or turns and or car accidents where their hip subluxates or moves in their joint a little bit and can tear it. Uh, but more commonly, I see overuse. So I see patients that continuously put their hips in positions that can tear it again and again. And then they come in saying, I've been having an increase in pain over the last couple of months and it's just not getting any better. Well, typical hip pain kind of uh, ache in the side that goes into the groin. Is that the case with this or is it is there some is there some way people would know, oh, it's a torn labrum. It's not arthritis of the hip or is it pretty much all the same stuff? So, you know, a distinction between a torn labrum and arthritis of the hip would be probably uh, somebody who, you know, who's starting to get a little stiff in the morning, losing range of motion in their hip, kind of achy uh, throughout the day. That's more arthritic symptoms. Um, labral pain is typically more sharp, pinchy pain, and it's kind of deep in the front of your hip, or we call the groin of your hip. Uh, typically worse with sitting in a chair upright for long periods of time or driving in the car for a while. Or if you squat down to grab something off the ground, it can pinch. Uh, rotating your leg out of the car can be painful. And so those are kind of some signs we see. Um, Sometimes we see patients will complain of clicking or catching or locking in the hip associated with the labral tear. And it's typically, typically a kind of a sharp pain you get with those motions. Is the labral pain, is the pain from a labral tear there all the time or can it be come and go? What's, what's the pattern? So it depends on position. So typically we see more positional pain than when you initially tear it. So if you're walking around, you may not have any pain until you sit down and you start pinching that labrum again when you're sitting. And so it may not be a constant pain, but then when it becomes a little more chronic, as in when you've had it for three, you know, three to six months or even longer, that's when your hip can get inflamed and irritated and then it becomes kind of a constant ache. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, so that's what it's like. And this person we're thinking of, they know they've got it because they had the MRI. I want to run you through a series of common interventions and maybe as an expert, let me get your impression. Do these things work or really kind of not work? And the sure. first intervention I want to ask is uh, just self healing. If you don't do anything, is it likely to heal itself or do almost all of them end up needing help to get better? So typically labrums do not heal on their own. I think there's some rare instances where they will or scar in and not bother you anymore. But typically because the blood supply to the labrum is not very good, we see these tears just kind of stay there and they don't really heal without some sort of intervention. Is there an amount of time somebody should wait before they get an MRI? Like let's say my hip starts hurting on Monday. Should I get an MRI on Tuesday or should I wait? If I suspect I have a labral tear, should I wait some amount of time or, or does it really matter? Kind of the rule of thumb with soft tissue injury, injuries is give it a little time, see if it improves. You know, take a short course of anti-inflammatories, rest from any sort of event that you think may have caused it. So avoid like high impact exercises, um, any sort of exercise that would irritate it. Uh, ice can be your uh, best friend during these times as well. If it doesn't improve over a couple of weeks and you're still seeing a lot of pain or if it's getting worse, that's when you may need to see your doctor to get a workup for a labral tear. Okay. And when I see my doctor, you know, he's going to order an x-ray because that's what they always do. Is the x-ray going to show the labral tear? So typically x-rays only show bone. So bone is uh, what we look on x-rays are we look at your joint space. So we try to rule out any sort of arthritis in your hip. We rule out any fractures or any sort of dislocations or any sort of bone lesions we'd be concerned about. And then the other thing I like to look at when we get x-rays is we look at something called uh, hip impingement. So we look for extra bone around the hip that could be causing a labral tear. So that's the first diagnostic tool I use when I see a patient in clinic is an x-ray and that can tell a lot. And I'm able to diagnose a lot of patients with label tears just based on the x-rays alone because of that. Well, okay. So I've seen my doctor, I got the x-ray. It didn't, it, it, let's say it didn't show the impingement and it didn't show any extra bone. So they have no idea what's wrong with me. It hurts like heck. They're going to send me to physical therapy. Is that going to do any good? The kind of kinetic analysis and balance, is that is that going to be helpful or is that a waste of time? So what the studies show is when you do physical therapy for a labral tear, 20% of people get better with that and about 80% don't. So the odds are against you that you'll get better with physical therapy. But the role of physical therapy in labral tears is really just to change some of your pelvic tilt alignment. Mm -hmm. You're not changing as much. And so if you can strengthen the muscles around your hip, it does seem to help some patients and some patients still feel like they're getting better. They kind of hit a wall at some point with the physical therapy and say, well, I feel better and stronger, but my hip still hurts. So that's when you say, all right, we need to get an MRI. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? It's torn. There's no amount of physical therapy that's going to correct that. It's correct. It is what it is. And um, well, I found something on the internet I wanted to ask you about really quickly. Um, this is a device which is advertised specifically for labral tears. And uh, maybe you can tell me what you think. It's the King brand hip labrum tear treatment, healing solution for labral tears. As I scroll through this, it looks like it's a, a blood flow. It, it, it's cold, which probably cold's probably good, right? Yes but it does something to produce blood flow by stimulation. Is this credible? Is this something that makes sense to you? So I think it may help with some of the symptoms, but I don't think it, it, it heals the labral tear because you got to keep in mind, putting a cold pack around your hip is going to make it feel better for a short period of time. But that hip is pretty deep in your body there. That's a deeper joint. So putting something superficial on your skin is not going to get anything a deep structure to heal on its own. And so no matter how much increase in blood flow you put in that to that area or how much cold therapy you do, that's not going to heal without something, some sort of deeper intervention. And this, uh, this kind of fancy looking pink 
tape. Um, I don't see that healing my torn labrum either, Dr. Bird. No, that might that might help you with the side of the hip pain if you get a little bursitis from your labral tear. So that yeah. might help a little bit with that, but that's not going to get your labrum to heal. Yeah, I mean, I think you're a nice guy, but I would save my 182 bucks on this, you guys. I think this is a scam. I agree. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, my uh, my tape didn't work. It's not my bursa. MRI was done. I went through a short course of physical therapy. And by the way, if I end up with a chiropractor, they can't reduce anything to make this better. So this is not something if I go to one or two or three or four or five treatments and I'm not better, I'm done with chiropractic. I'm done with physical therapy. So I get an MRI, it confirms the labral tear, and now I, I need to see a surgeon. So I come to see you. What, what are you going to do? What's going to happen next? Well, so I get a history from you. I try to line up your symptoms that are consistent with the labral tear. So if you check off all the boxes for having those similar symptoms, um, I will do the uh, x-rays uh, and then look over your MRI, review your MRI with you. Um, and if you've already tried some physical therapy, uh, you know, tried anti-inflammatories, tried taking uh, a break from any sort of inciting events that cause the pain, then we'll discuss doing an arthroscopic procedure to fix the labrum. Now, what about injections? Is there any point in having a cortisone injection or even a stem cell injection for this? So injections are a good option when you want to have temporary relief. So I see in-season athletes who come in with a labral tear mm -hmm. but want to get through those last couple of months of football or hockey or baseball. Say, all right, well, we can do one cortisone injection into your hip. We'll decrease the pain, decrease the inflammation, and you'll be able to perform again at a higher level. But keep in mind that pain will come back when that steroid wears off. Um, stem cell injections are another strong, you know, anti-inflammatory as well. But there's no studies showing that stem cell injections will get the labrum to heal on its own. So very similar to the knee there as well, right? It definitely might be good to sort of palliative, sort of string you along, but it's not going to fix it. Correct. I got to tell you a personal story. Um, I've had two people with labral tears and my friends and family. First gal was five years ago, very good friend, could not find a single doctor in Phoenix who could do an arthroscopic repair. Ended up having to go to Aspen, Colorado at some place, you know, had to search all over the country. So let me just say to all of our viewers, we're very lucky today because these things really, really hurt. and. It's only um, fairly recently that we've got really high quality doctors right here in town. And frankly, there aren't many um, who, who can even do this operation. Why is that? Is it a hard operation? Is it, is it a new operation? How come so few providers seem to be able to do, do this? So it's a relatively new pr uh, procedure. We've been doing it probably for about 15 years now, um, but it's been evolving over the last you know, 10 years and we've changed our techniques, changed our approach to it. Um, and so every year there's something different we're doing and we're getting better results from it. The other issue is that it's a steep learning curve. The hip is a deep structure. We got to use longer instrumentation. So we have more limited mobility inside the joint when we're working and uh, just tough areas to get to. So you, you don't see a lot of doctors just doing, um, a, you know, a lot of physicians doing high volume. You see some doing a couple a year, but those, you know, you typically don't want to see a doctor who just does a couple of anything a year. You want a doctor who does, you know, one to 200 to 300 a year, which I do. So you want a high volume physician. Yeah, you do not want to be on somebody's learning curve. I mean, right. I, I'm not speaking bad about other doctors, but you, there's, everybody's got to learn. You don't want to be on somebody's learning curve. That's the man. You want to go to the guy who, is, or the person, who is doing this operation a lot, knows how to do it, and is very skilled at it. Hey, I've got a graphic that I'm going to ask you to kind of take us through, if you don't mind. It's a, a video from the internet, and it gives a really good look at this procedure and um, how it goes. If it's okay, I'm just going to let this run and yep. maybe ask you to kind of tell us what we're seeing. Yeah, so you're looking at the, the hip joint here. They've actually pulled the ball out of the socket here. 
what we're seeing in this video is a little bit more of an advanced procedure. So right now they're burying the, the socket, the rim of the socket to uh, get some bleeding bone. And you can see the labrum, which is that white structure on the back and front is missing in the middle. So what they're doing now is measuring that defect or where the labrum should be to, to get a size to put in a new labrum. And so now they're drilling a little hole in the bone in the front uh, that's going into the socket and another one in the back. And uh, what you're about to see is something called a labral reconstruction. So this is where we take cadaver graft, which is measured length there from what we just measured inside the joint. And we kind of prepare it on the back table with one of our assistants there using a, these sutures and roll it up to make it look like a, uh, a, a labrum, a native labrum in your hip. So this is kind of the technique we use is putting sutures in it, um, and then now we're putting it through an anchor. And then this is a plastic anchor that goes into the bone. And that's how we fix one end of the graft to the bone. So that's uh, the anchor now down on one side. Now we're putting on the anchor on the other side. And I'll put one in the middle as well here. And this is now fixing the graft or the new labrum onto the rim there. So now you've seen we filled that defect where that labral uh, deficiency was. And now uh, it moves normal and feels uh, good again with a good suction seal. And that's kind of the goal of that surgery is just to let it, and it all heals in over time there. Wow, that's really cool. That seems like a phenomenal operation, frankly, especially when you consider that they're there really isn't an alternative, right? Yeah, I mean, so for some like that, when you've already had, if, a lot of times I do those on revision. So let's say we do a labral repair, uh, it doesn't heal or somebody else does a labral repair, it doesn't heal, and then you have to go back in and the labral quality of the tissue is poor. Mm -hmm. You gotta do some called labral reconstruction with which that uh, demonstration was. Um, but they do really well. But the problem is if it's either that or a total hip. And there's a lot of young patients out there who have deficient labrums who would benefit from a surgery like that instead of getting a total hip at a young age, which nobody wants. They don't have to. Yeah, and, you know, we, we often think about 55 as really, of course, you can have a total hip at any age, right? If you Correct. Have to, but here's an opportunity not to. What's your, do you have an age that's kind of a breakaway point for you where you say, oh, you're 55, just go have a total? Or would you try this in a 60-year-old? So I, I have done six year olds. I don't treat patients by their age. I treat them by their physiology. So if they're if they're a young 60 year old or they have a very healthy hip and they're in good shape. I mean, I did a 65 year old um, a couple months ago who was a runner and his hip looked great. It looked like a 25 year old hip. And I, I did a labor repair and he's doing great. But then I'll see 60, 65 year olds who have early arthritis. They're not the you know, not in the best shape, a little, you know, a little overweight. And I'll say it's probably better for you just to get a total hip, to have one surgery, easier to recover from, and then not have to worry about your hip anymore. So that's the clinical judgment that you have to arrive at with the patient in deciding what's best for every patient. Correct. What about, what about the tear itself? Uh, does the location of the tear determine which ones can be repaired and which ones maybe cannot? Or is are they pretty much all repairable now? So most labral... Uh, tears are repairable. It, the quality of the tissues is is the problem. So sometimes I get in there and the tissue is either ossified from being chronically impinged and so it becomes bone, mm. take out and reconstruct. Or it's a very small labrum where if I, I try to fix it, it functions. So then those are ones I have to reconstruct. Or it's just extremely degenerative and that even trying to put a suture through it, it just tears right through it ones that you can't repair. So it's really based on quality, not location, because I can repair any any location in the hip. It's just some some labels are just not fixable. Right. It could just be too far gone. Yep. Well, Dr. Timber, um, the second person in my family was my nephew who had one of these years ago when he was young. And I've seen with my own eyes as a family member and as a doctor, this is a life saving operation. People go from just incapacitated in severe pain to normal in fairly short order. So it's a really a great gift that your skill and expertise is bringing to our community. 
Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for the information. Any last words, last thought? Um, I would just say, if you ever have to see anybody for a labral tear, just make sure they do a lot of them because you can have a very poor outcome if it isn't done correctly. Well, if I was you and I had to see someone for a labral tear, I'd see that guy. Right. <laughs> he's, uh, he's being modest, but yeah, it don't don't be on somebody's learning curve. Well, have right. a great day. Good talking to you. All right, thank you. Uh -huh.